Eleven Jewish community centers across the country were hit by another wave of bomb threats on Monday. It was the fourth wave of nationwide bomb threats against JCCs in the last five weeks. In total, 69 threats have been reported against 54 JCCs. Meanwhile, at a cemetery in University City, Missouri, the grave sites of more than 100 Jews were vandalized over the weekend. The Southern Poverty Law Center has revealed the number of anti-Muslim groups in the United States tripled last year, from 34 uh, in 2015 to 101 last year. The Southern Poverty Law Center and other groups have said hate groups have been energized by the candidacy and then the election of Donald Trump. In recent weeks, Trump has faced increasing criticism for failing to denounce anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim threats. Well, on Tuesday, President Trump briefly addressed the recent wave of anti-Semitic threats, after tremendous public outcry that he hadn't. His comments came after he toured the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. The anti-Semitic threats targeting our Jewish community and community centers are horrible and are painful and a very sad reminder of the work that still must be done to root out hate and prejudice and evil. President Trump's reading of that statement came less than a week after he chastised Jewish reporter Jake Turks for asking about the recent bomb threats at uh, President Trump's news conference. What we are concerned about and what we haven't really uh, heard being addressed is an uptick in anti-Semitism and how the government is planning to take care of it. There's been a report out that 48 uh, uh, bomb threats have been made against Jewish centers all across the country in the last couple of weeks. There are people who are committing anti-Semitic acts or threatening to— you see, he said he's going to ask a very simple, easy question. And it's not. It's an important It's not. Not a, not a simple question. Not a fair question. Okay, sit down. I, I understand the rest of your question. So here's the story, folks. Uh, number one, I am the least anti-Semitic person that you've ever seen in your entire life. Number two, racism, the least racist person. In fact, we did very well relative to other people running as a Republican. Quiet, quiet, quiet. See, he lied about he was going to get up and ask a very straight, simple question. So, you know, it's welcome to the world of the media. He was telling the Jewish reporter to be quiet, quiet, quiet. Well, during a separate news conference only days earlier, uh, when he was standing with the Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, President Trump responded to a question from an Israeli reporter about the rise in anti-Semitic attacks by boasting about his election victory. Well, for more, we're joined by two guests, Stephen Goldstein, the executive director of the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect here in New York. The group posted a statement on Facebook, Mr. President, you're too little, too late. Acknowledgement of anti-Semitism today is not enough. And in Montgomery, Alabama, we're joined by Mark Potok. He is senior fellow at the Southern Poverty Law Center. He authored the group's year-end report, Hate Groups Increase for Second Consecutive Year as Trump Electrifies Radical Right. Uh, Stephen Goldstein and Mark Potok, welcome to Democracy Now! Stephen, let's begin with you. So, you just heard that statement he read at the African American Museum. Uh, your response? Well, I actually thought the president lost it, if it was possible to think that he already hadn't lost it. His response was remarkable for its tin eardom. This president said absolutely nothing over the weekend when Jewish grave sites were desecrated. He said absolutely nothing about bomb threats, and he refused even to include Jews in the Holocaust. Then all of a sudden— You mean the, the Holocaust World Remembrance. Holocaust Day? Exactly. He did not uh, cite Ast Jews as— Amy, astonishing, go. astonishing. Then all of a sudden, he wakes up on a Tuesday, decides to give a speech, which, by the way, he read with all the sincerity of a bad method actor. And this is a president who really knows how to speak with with passion when he wants to. And he expected our applause simply because he acknowledges anti-Semitism. And I have to ask, are our nation's expectations so low that our president, merely by acknowledging anti-Semitism, something other presidents have now done for decades, should receive some applause? And worse yet, his spokesperson, Sean Spicer, yesterday chastised my organization for not applauding and be grateful for the president's remarks. It's unbelievable. It was as if little crumbs of condescension were being thrown my organization's way. 
remarkable tin eardom and remarkable prejudice coming from this administration. Hmm. Um, I want to see if we have this clip of the report of the reporter who asked the question yesterday. This is CBS News Foreign Affairs and White House correspondent Margaret Brennan questioning White House spokesperson Sean Spicer. Sean, um, I want to give you a chance to respond to something, because I think the, the president's remarks and your clarification about where he stands on anti-Semitism is clear. But after that statement was uh, made by the president, the Anne Frank Center released a pretty strongly worded one, right. saying um, that these remarks, while well received, are a Band-Aid on the cancer within the Trump administration, uh, saying that there is, whether blessed or otherwise, a sense of xenophobia within this administration. Yeah, I, I think it's it's, look, the president has made clear since the day he was elected, and frankly, going back through the campaign, that he is someone that seeks to unite this country. Um, he has brought a diverse group of folks into his administration, uh, both in terms of actual positions and people that he has sought the advice of. Um, and I think um, he has been very forceful with his denunciation of people who seek to um, attack people because of their hate, because of, excuse me, because of their religion, because of their gender, because of the color of their skin. And it's something that he's going to continue to fight and make very, very clear that he has no place uh, in this administration. But I, I think that it's, it's ironic that no matter how many times he talks about this, that it's never good enough. Um, today, I think, was an unbelievably forceful comment by the president as far as his denunciation. Uh, of the actions that are currently targeted towards Jewish community centers. But I think that he's been very clear um, previous to this that he wants to be someone that brings his country together and not divide people, um, especially in those areas. So I, I saw that statement. I, I wish that they had um, praised the president for his leadership in this area. And I think that hopefully, as time continues to go by, they recognize um, his commitment to civil rights, to um, voting rights, to equality for all Americans. So that was Sean Spicer at his White House press briefing, Stephen Goldstein. That was insane. I, I, Sean Spicer is living in a parallel universe, first of all, admonishing us that we should praise the president. Are we supposed to salute this president? And as far as the words of the president being good enough, who says that to an oppressed community, that our words should be good enough? They simply cannot relate to anyone who looks like themselves. And as far as this president repeatedly calling out anti-Semitism, let alone Islamophobia, racism, sexism, he never speaks about it. So I don't know what, sh oh, what script Sean Spicer was reading from, but it was not a script from reality. Um, also yesterday, um, our other guest's organization was raised uh, when the CBS News Foreign Affairs White House correspondent, um, Margaret Brennan, also questioned uh, Spicer on Tuesday. Southern Poverty Law Center said that the number of anti-Muslim groups in the U.S. has tripled between 2015 and 2016, during the time of the campaign. Is this message within the administration, anti-Semitism is not allowed, xenophobia is not allowed, anti-Muslim sentiment within the administration, has the president been forceful about that particular issue? Well, I don't, I, I think that the president, in terms of his desire to combat radical Islamic terrorism, he understands that people who want to express a, a peaceful position uh, have every right in our constitution. But if you come here or want to express views that are seek to do our country, our people harm, he's going to fight it aggressively, whether it's domestic acts that are going on here or attempts through people abroad to come into this country. So there's a big difference between preventing attacks and making sure that we keep this country safe so that there is no loss of life and allowing people to express themselves in accordance with our First Amendment. Those are two very, very different, different, different things. So that was White House spokesperson Sean Spicer. Mark Potok is with us uh, of the Southern Poverty Law Center, speaking to us from Montgomery, Alabama. Your response, Mark? Well, I mean, I just have to agree. These comments from Spicer, from Trump, are ludicrous in the extreme. I agree that uh, they both seem to be living in another universe. I, I mean, let's get real about Trump. This is, he's the divider in chief. This is a guy who began his campaign describing Mexican immigrants as rapists and drug dealers. Uh, and he has gone on to denounce just about every minority out there. Uh, you know, it has just been an extraordinary thing to watch. 
Uh, I think that, uh, you know, what has happened with Trump is that when he finally gets backed into a corner uh, by reporters or other people, uh, you know, he kind of uh, says a few words, uh, as was said by the other guests just now, with incredible insincerity uh, about how terrible this anti-Semitism is and uh, Islamophobia and so on. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the truth is, is that Donald Trump has played footsie. Uh, with the radical right from the very start of his campaign. Uh, he has studiously avoided denouncing or disavowing the extreme right again and again and again. I mean, let's remember how Trump uh, claimed not to know who David Duke, uh, the former Klan leader, uh, is. Uh, therefore, he couldn't disavow him. You know, that was simply a falsehood, a lie, to speak plainly. Uh, he knew perfectly well who Duke was. In fact, in 2000, uh, Trump wrote an essay in the New York Times saying why he was dropping uh, his bid for the presidency on the Reform Party ticket, because Duke was associated with the Reform Party and Trump couldn't have anything to do with it. So this is all a word game uh, with an awful lot of falsehoods being sprinkled well, around. We're going to break. When we come back, I want to ask you about what you wrote. The radical right was more successful in entering the political mainstream last year than in half a century. We are speaking with Mark Potok of the Southern Poverty Law Center, as well as Stephen Goldstein of the Anne Frank Center here in New York. Stay with us.